is it? Yes, it is, for I have just had it from Mrs. Long. And do you not want to know who has taken it? Uh, you want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. Why, then, it is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England. A single man of large fortune, my dear. He came down on Monday in a chaise and four to see the place. His name is Bingley, and he will be in possession by Michaelmas. And he has five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? Um, how can it affect them? Oh, Mr. Bennett, how can you be so tiresome? You must know that I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. Or a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. <laughs> yes, he must indeed. And who better than one of our five girls? <laughs> me. Yeah. What a fine joke if he were to choose me. Or me. <laughs> so that is his design in settling here, to marry one of our daughters. Design? Oh, how can you talk such nonsense? But you know he may very likely fall in love with one of them. Therefore, you must visit him directly he comes. Visit him? Oh, no, no, I see no occasion for that. Oh, Mr. Bennett! Go yourself with the girls. Or, still better, send them by themselves. By themselves? Aye, for you're as handsome as any other Mr. Bingley might like you best of the party. Mr. Bingley has come to Netherfield. And Sir William Lucas has called on him. Save your breath to come your porridge, Kitty. I will tell Mama. Do not wish to know. What should we care for Mr. Bingley since we are never to be acquainted with him? But Mama! <coughs> Servants, and he's very handsome and wears a blue coat. And he declared to Sir William that he loves to dance. And he's promised to come to the next ball. At the assembly room. On Saturday. And bring six ladies and four gentlemen. Nay, it was twelve ladies and seven gentlemen. Too many ladies. Oh, Lydia, I beg you would stop. For we are never to know Mr. Bingley, and it pains me to hear of him. But, Mama. I am sick of Mr. Bingley. I'm sorry to hear that. If I'd known as much this morning, I should never have called on him. I'm afraid we cannot escape the acquaintance now. Oh, my dear Mr. Penny, how good you are to us. Yeah, well, well. <laughs> oh, girls, girls, is he not a good father? Yeah. And never to tell us what a good joke. <laughs> oh, and now you shall all dance with Mr. Bingley. <laughs> Come, Darcy, I must have you dance. I must. Hates you standing about in this stupid manner. Come, you'd much better dance. I certainly shall not. An assembly such as this, it would be insupportable. Your sisters are engaged at present. You know perfectly well it would be a punishment to me to stand up with any other woman in the room. Good God, Darcy, I wouldn't be as fastidious as you are for a kingdom. Upon my honour. I never met so many pleasant girls in my life. Several of them uncommonly pretty. Eh? You have been dancing with the only handsome girl in the room. Darcy, she is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. Look, look. There's one of her sisters. She's very pretty too. And I dare say, very agreeable. She is tolerable, I suppose. But she's not handsome enough to tempt me. Bingley, I'm in no humour to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. Go back to your partner. Enjoy her smiles. You're wasting your time with me. with Lizzie, and then what do you think he did next? Enough, enough, madam. For God's sake, let's hear no more of his partners. Would he had sprained his ankle in the first dance? Oh, and his sisters. Oh, such charming women, so elegant and obliging. 
changing. Oh, I wish you had seen them. I dare say the lace on Mrs. Hurst's gown No alone. lace. No lace, Mrs. Bennet, I beg you. But the man he brought with him, Mr. Darcy, as he calls himself, is not worth our concern. Though he may be the richest man in Derbyshire. The proudest, the most horrid, disobliging. He slighted poor Lizzie, you know, and flatly refused to stand up with her. Slighted my Lizzie, did he? Mm -hmm. I didn't care for him either, Father, so it's of little matter. Another time, Lizzie, I would not dance with him if he should ask you. I believe, ma'am, I may safely promise you never to dance with Mr. Darcy. Oh, we must allow her to be an excellent walker, I suppose. But her appearance this morning, she really looked almost wild. I hardly keep my countenance. What does she mean by scampering about the country because her sister has a cold? <laughs> her hair, Louisa. Well, her petticoat. I hope you saw her petticoat, brother. Six inches deep in mud, I'm absolutely certain. I must confess it quite escaped my notice. I thought she looked remarkably well. You observed it, I'm sure, Mr Darcy. I did. I'm inclined to think you wouldn't wish your sister to make such an exhibition. Certainly not. It seems to me to show an abominable sort of conceited independence. Hmm? It shows an affection for her sister that is very pleasing. I'm afraid, Mr. Darcy, that this escapade may have affected your admiration for her fine eyes. Not at all. They were brightened by the exercise. But Jane Bennet is a sweet girl. It's very sad she should have such an unfortunate family, such low connections. Their uncle, she told us, is in trade and lives in Cheapside. Well, perhaps we should call when we are next in town. <laughs> well, you have a sweet room here. I think you will never want to leave Netherfield now you are come here. I believe I should be happy to live in the country forever. Wouldn't you, Darcy? You would? You don't find the society somewhat confined and unvarying for your taste? Confined and unvarying indeed it is not, sir. The country is a vast deal pleasanter than town, whatever you may say about it. Mama, you mistake Mr. Darcy's meaning. Do I? Do I? He seems to think the country nothing at all. Mama. Confined, unvarying. I would have him know we dine with four and twenty families. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Charlotte Lucas since I came away? Yes, she called yesterday with Sir William. What an agreeable man he is. That is my idea of good breeding. And those persons who fancy themselves very important and never open their mouths quite mistake the matter. Uh, Mr Bingley, did you not promise to give a ball at Netherfield as soon as you were settled here? It will be a great scandal if you don't keep your word. I am perfectly ready to keep my engagement. And when your sister has recovered, you shall name the day of the ball, if you please. Oh, there now, Lydia, that's a fair promise for you. That's generosity for you. That's what I call gentlemanly behaviour. My dear sir, the disagreement subsisting between yourself and my late honoured father always gave me much uneasiness, and since I have had the misfortune to lose him, <laughs> to lose him, I have frequently wished to heal the breach. There, Mrs. Bennet. My mind, however, is now made up on the subject. For having received my ordination at Easter, I have been so fortunate as to be distinguished by the patronage of the Right Honourable Lady Catherine de Bourgh, whose bounty and beneficence has preferred me to the valuable rectory at Hunsford, where it is my earnest endeavour to demean myself with grateful respect towards her ladyship. As a clergyman, moreover, I feel it my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families within the reach of my influence. And on these grounds, I flatter myself that my present overtures of goodwill are highly commendable and will not lead you to reject the offered olive branch. 
I am, sir, keenly conscious of being the means of injuring your amiable daughters and assure you of my readiness to make them every possible amends. I propose myself the satisfaction of waiting on you and your family on Monday the 18th. Have a care, Dawkins, and shall probably trespass on your hospitality till the Saturday seven night following. I shall travel as far as the turnpike in my own modest equipage, where I hope to catch the Bromley Post at 35 minutes past 10, and thence to Watford, from whence I shall engage a hired carriage to transport me to Longbourn, where, God willing, you may expect me by four in the afternoon. And here he comes. But he must be an oddity, don't you think? Well, if he's disposed to make our girls any amends, I shan't be the person to discourage him. Can you be a sensible man, sir? Oh, I think not, my dear. Indeed, I have great hopes of finding him quite the reverse. Mr. Collins, you are very welcome. My dear Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. You seem uh, very uh, uh, fortunate in your patroness, sir. Lady Catherine de Berg. Indeed, I am, sir. I have been treated with such affability, such condescension as I would never have dared to hope for. I have been invited twice to dine at Rosings Park. That's so uh, amazing. Does she live near you, sir? The garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park. Only a lane, eh? Oh, fancy that, Lizzie. Mm -hmm. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? Oh, she has one daughter, ma'am, the heiress of Rosings, and of very extensive property. And has she been presented at court? She is unfortunately of a sickly constitution, which unhappily prevents her being in town. And by that means, as I told Lady Catherine myself one day, she has deprived the British court of its brightest ornament. Mm -hmm. You may imagine, sir, how happy I am on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. <laughs> It is fortunate for you, Mr. Collins, that you possess such an extraordinary talent for flattering with delicacy. Uh, may I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment, or are they the result of previous study? They arise chiefly from what is passing at the time, sir. I do sometimes amuse myself by writing down and arranging such little compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions. <laughs> but I try to give them as unstudied an air as possible. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I must confess myself quite overwhelmed with the charms of your daughters, Mrs. Bennet. <laughs> You are very kind, sir. They are sweet girls, though I say it myself. Perhaps they're especially the eldest, Miss Bennet? Ah, yes. Jane is admired wherever she goes. But I think I should tell you, Mr. Collins, I think it very likely she will be very soon engaged. Ah. As for my younger daughters, now, if any of them... In their case, I know of no prior attachment at all. Ah. <laughs> We're all going to Meriton, Mama, to see if Denny's returned from town. Perhaps you would care for a little exercise, Mr. Collins. Indeed, I would, Mrs. Bennet. <laughs> oh. Cousin Elizabeth! Would you do me the great honour of walking with me into town? Where? There, look! Is that 
with him? I don't know. He's fearful handsome. He might be if he were in regimentals. I think a man looks nothing without regimentals. Mm -hmm. They're looking over. <laughs> Lizzie, is he not mightily good looking? Danny! Lydia! <laughs> what a fine joke. We thought you were still in town. There was nothing amusing enough to hold us there. <laughs> Allow me to introduce my good friend, George Wick. Miss Bennett, Miss Elizabeth Bennett, Miss Mary Bennett, Miss Catherine Bennett, and uh, Miss Lydia Bennett. This is our cousin, Mr. Collins. <laughs> you stay long in Meryton, Mr. Wickham? Uh, all winter, I'm happy to say. I've taken a commission in Colonel Forster's regiment. There, Lydia. He will be dressed in regimental. <laughs> And lend them much distinction, I dare say. Out swagger us all, eh, Wickham? <laughs> Denny, you misrepresent me to these young ladies. Shall you come with us to our Aunt Phillips this evening, Mr. Oh, yes. Wickham? Denny is coming, you know. It's only supper and cards, but we shall have some laughs. I'm afraid I've not been invited by Mr. and Mrs. Phillips. Oh, no one cares about that sort of thing nowadays. But if Mrs. Phillips extended the invitation to include me, I should be delighted. Look, Jane, it's Mr. Bingley. <laughs> How very fortunate. Do you know we were just on our way to Longbourn to ask after your health? You are very kind, sir. I'm quite recovered, as you see. Yes, I'm very glad to know it. I hope you will still be able to come in to have tea with us. I shall be very happy to, Miss Bennett. be as pretty as your sister Jane, but I will say you look very well indeed. Thank you, Mama. And I hope you will pay Mr. Collins every courtesy tonight because he has been very attentive to you. I think your gown is very unbecoming. Then I shall ask Lizzie. She will bear me out. Lydia, child, what are you doing? Go back in the room and dress yourself. I have to ask Lizzie something. Oh. Lizzie. Lizzie, look. What do you think? Kitty says not, but I think it becomes me very well. I wonder that you ask me, then. You look very nice. Thank you. Lizzie, I hope you'll not keep Wickham to yourself all night. Kitty and I want to dance with him as well, you know. I promise I shall not. Even if I wished to, I could not. I have to dance at least the first two with Mr. Colin. Oh, Lord, yes. He's threatened to dance with us all. <sighs> <laughs> say that you hardly ever forgave, that your resentment once created was implacable. You are very careful, are you not, in allowing your resentment to be created? I am. And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice? 
hope not. May I ask to what these questions tend? Merely to the illustration of your character. I'm trying to make it out. And what is your success? I do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as to puzzle me exceedingly. I wish, Miss Bennett, that you would not attempt to sketch my character at the present moment. I fear the performance would reflect no credit on either of us. But if I don't take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours. You are the nephew of Lady Catherine de Bourgh of Rosings Park. Well, Mr. Darcy, I am in the happy position of being able to inform you that her ladyship was in the best of health eight days ago. I'm glad to hear it. Yes. And what is your name, sir? My name is William Collins, Mr. Darcy, and I have a very Great honor. Well, Delighted us long enough. Let the other young ladies have time to exhibit. Believe me, my dear Miss Elizabeth, that your modesty adds to your other perfections. But you can hardly doubt the object of my discourse. However, your feminine delicacy may lead you to dissemble. For as almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. <laughs> but before I am run away by my feelings on this subject, perhaps it would be advisable for me to state my reasons for marrying. Mr. Collins. <clears throat> My reasons for marrying are, first, that I think it a right thing for every clergyman to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, that I am convinced it will add very greatly to my happiness. And thirdly, which 
perhaps I should have mentioned first that it is the particular recommendation of my noble patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Mr. Collins, she said, you must marry. Choose properly, she said. Choose a gentlewoman for my sake, and for your own, let her be an active, useful sort of person. But not brought up too high. Find such a woman as soon as you can. Bring her to Hunsford, and I will visit her. And your wit and vivacity, I think, must be acceptable to her. And when tempered with the silence and respect which her rank will inevitably excite. <laughs> yes. So much for my general intention in favor of matrimony. Now, as to my particular choice. My dear cousin, being as I am to inherit all of this estate after the death of your father, I could not satisfy myself without resolving to choose a wife from among his daughters. And now, nothing remains but to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affections. Mr. Collins, please. To fortune, I am perfectly indifferent. I am well aware that 1,000 pounds in the four percents is all you may ever be entitled to. But rest assured, I shall never reproach on that score when we are married. You are too hasty, sir. You forget that I have made no answer. Let me do so now. I thank you for your compliments. I am very sensible of the honor of your proposals, but it is impossible for me to accept them. <laughs> yes, I am by no means discouraged, indeed not. I understand that it is usual with young ladies to reject the addresses of the man they secretly mean to accept when he first applies for their favor, and therefore I shall hope my dear cousin, to lead you to the altar before long. Upon my word, your hope is an extraordinary one in view of my declaration. I was perfectly serious in my refusal. You could not make me happy, and I am convinced I am the last woman in the world who could make you so. My dear Miss Elizabeth, my situation in life, my connection with the noble family of de Bourgh are circumstances highly in my favor. You should consider that it is by no means certain that another offer of marriage may ever be made to you. You cannot be serious in your rejection. I must attribute it to your wish of increasing my love by suspense in the usual manner of elegant females. I assure you, sir, that I have no pretensions to the kind of elegance which consists in tormenting a respectable man. I thank you for the honor of your proposals, but to accept them is absolutely impossible. My feelings forbid it in every respect. Can I speak plainer? Oh, you are uniformly charming. And I am persuaded that when sanctioned by your excellent parents, my proposals will not fail of being acceptable. wanted immediately. We are all in uproar. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him, and if you do not make haste, Mr. Collins will change his mind and he will not have her. I've not the pleasure of understanding you. Uh, of uh, what are you talking? Of oh, Mr. Collins and Lizzie. Lizzie declares she will not have Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins begins to say he will not have Lizzie. Well, what am I to do on the occasion? Seems a hopeless business. Oh, speak to Lizzie about it yourself. Tell her you insist upon her marrying him. Let her come in. <laughs> Lizzie! Lizzie! Your father wishes to speak to you. Uh, come here, my child.
I, um, I understand Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. It is true? Yes, sir. Right, very well. And uh, this, uh, this offer of marriage you have refused? I have. I see. <clears throat> right, well, we now come to the point. Uh, your mother insists on your accepting it. Is it not so, Mrs. Bennet? Yes. Or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And uh, I will never see you again if you do. <laughs> <laughs>